Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, in the earlier lecture we discussed the judicial control over delegated legislation. So, in earlier two lectures we were talking about the administrative rule making, the rule making power of administration or the delegated legislation. We discussed the delegated legislation in three parts the rule making powers of the administration that is the delegated legislation, then the procedural and parliamentary control on delegated legislation and the judicial control on delegated legislation. As we discussed the de delegated legislation or the rule making powers of the administration, in the present lecture we are going to discuss the decision making powers of administration which is called as administrative adjudication. The decision making powers of the administration are also the byproduct of the output of the transformation from laissez faire to welfare state as the delegated legislation was. So, the two administrative processes emerged out in all this development in 20th century and these two new administrative processes are the delegated legislation, the rule making powers of the administration and the decision making powers of the administration or the administrative adjudication. The administrative adjudication refers to the adjudication by the administrative authorities, the adjudication by the administrative agencies, the adjudication by the executive branch of the government. As we all know that the judicial functions are assigned to the judiciary or the courts and courts are supposed to adjudicate the matters, courts are supposed to exercise the adjudicatory powers or to perform the adjudicatory functions. But the compulsion or the pressure or the need of the time because of the overburdened state with relation to its functions and powers. The introduction of the sociological, socio-economic schemes and the welfare, the activity of welfare of the people by the state, these two new processes emerged. It is important for us to know about the adjudicatory powers or the administrative adjudication or the decision making powers of the administration. We will discuss the adjudicatory powers of the administration or the administrative adjudication in three parts. What was the need and what is the meaning of this administrative adjudication and what are the challenges before the administrative adjudication and then what are the procedures to be followed by the administrative agencies which exercise the administrative adjudicatory powers or the decision making powers. Decision making powers of the administration or the administrative adjudication, it has its own background, it has its own reasons to emerge, own justifications, own needs and requirements to emerge. As the circumstances show that courts cannot enjoy a monopoly on entire adjudicatory power in modern complex form of government during the regime of welfare state for many regions and these regions may be the increase in the functions of the government and when we talk about the increase in the functions of the government, it refers to the increase in the functions of all the three organs of the government that is the legislature, the judiciary, the executive. So, in this complex form of government during the regime of welfare state, all the three organs of the state 
they became overburdened. Legislature became overburdened, it had the lack of time, therefore, the process or the technique of delegated legislation emerged out. Likewise, the courts also became overburdened because of the new kinds of the cases, litigations and new huge number of litigations before the court. And it became impossible for the courts to give the decisions in the cases within the specified time work and therefore, the courts are not capable of giving the decisions in all the matters within a specified time framework and court could not be in position to enjoy the monopoly or to retain the monopoly over the adjudicatory functions and because of this reason the administrative adjudicatory process or the process of administrative adjudication process of decision making it emerged out wherein the, 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 the executive branch of the state or the government or administration it assumed the adjudicatory functions also the adjudicatory powers also. There was one more reason for the emergence of the administrative adjudicatory functions or the decision making powers of the administration. Because of the welfare state concept, there was the increase in the taxation. That increase we can understand because of the fact that during the laissez faire era, the state was confined only to do, only to perform three kind of functions. Number one, the security of a state from external aggressions. Number two, the internal security that is the maintenance of law and order situation within the boundaries of a state and number three, to give the justice or the judicial work, the work of adjudication by the courts. These were only the three tasks which were assigned to the state and for doing these limited works or three specified functions, the state needed not more revenue, not more money and therefore, the range of taxes, the number of taxes that was limited state required limited revenue, limited resources, limited finances and therefore, the state was not thinking about much and more taxes to be imposed on the citizens, on the people. But when the activities of state expanded and the state started to intervene or interfere in all the aspects of activities, in all the aspects of the human life the state started to run its own corporations, own industries, the public sector emerged out, the public industries, public corporations, public institutions, public health institutions, the public hospitals, government hospitals were started to be established, the government schools, the government or public transport of means of transport, they also started to be run. And because of all these activities, expanded activities of the state, wherein the main task of the state was to ensure the welfare of the people of the state, welfare of the people of the country, in which many social and economic activities were required to be done by the state to ensure the social justice, to ensure the economic justice. And this expansion in the activities of the state and particularly the welfare schemes, the welfare activities, the state required more and more revenue. The state do not have any resources other than the collection of revenue through the imposition of taxes. Because the state is doing all these activities, all these works, all these functions on the behalf of the people and therefore, the expenditure which is done on all these functions of the state, it is also accrued from the people themselves. This is the way by which the state collects revenue to perform its functions and therefore, there was the increase in the taxes by the state and the increase in the taxation for promoting general welfare of the people, it resulted into more disputes between individual and the administration that was also one important reason for the emergence of 
the administrative adjudicatory functions or the decision making functions or decision making powers of the administration. It is also important to note that socio economic laws, socio economic policies giving rise to the administrative controversies. When new, newer and newer schemes, socio economic schemes were started to be launched by the government, by the state to ensure the welfare of the people of the country, these also gave rise to the controversies, the disputes, the differences, the conflicts between the government, between the state and the individuals. So, new kind of controversies or disputes which were not there, very limited were there during the regime of laissez-faire state. Now, such a kind of disputes, disputes between the individual and the state, they started to come out. And it was thought that if these disputes are sent to the courts, ordinary courts for their decisions, then no socio-economic schemes or such plans and schemes, policies of welfare could be implemented within the specified time work, specified time period, because the, the procedure of the ordinary court is very rigid, it is very inflexible, it is very formal and the court, formal courts, they have to pass through this particular rigid, informal and inflexible procedure. They cannot avoid the procedure, they cannot bypass the procedure and always there is the delay in the court proceedings and therefore, if these cases are resolved or determined by the court or these cases or these disputes between the administration and the individual are allowed to be decided by the courts, then certainly no scheme, no policy which is intended to make the welfare or ensure the welfare of the people can be implemented within the specified time bar period. And that would be the frustration to the basic or fundamental objective of the policy of welfare state. That was also one reason that the technique of the process of administrative adjudication, wherein the administration itself resolves the disputes between the administration and the individual was discovered. One more reason for the emergence of such decision making powers of the administration or the administrative adjudication was the overburdened judiciary, the overburdened courts because of the tremendous function increase in the functions of all the three organs of the state, the legislature, the executive and the judiciary. Judiciary also became overburdened. If you see the data, lakhs of crores of cases are pending before the courts and courts are not in position to decide these cases within a time period and that is also the reason for the emergence of the adjudicatory powers in the hands of administration or the decision making powers in the hands of the administration. We can understand the state of overburdened judiciary and effect of this overburdened judiciary on the basic freedoms rights of the people by referring one important case that is Mahavir Jute Mills case. This Mahavir Jute Mills case was decided in 1975, wherein the Supreme Court of India itself observes that that was the failure of justice. The case was decided ultimately by the Supreme Court after a long legal battle, after 40 years from the filing of the case. In this case, the claims were made against the wrong for dismissal of an employee. And when the decision was made after 40 years, so red petitioners who filed the case, nobody was live. And in place of their vacant seats, almost 15, 10 to 15 years were completed by 
the new appointees. That was the state of circumstance in which the decision was made. It means that when the decision was made against the claim made by the petitioners on the basis of wrongful dismissal, nobody was alive to enjoy the decision of the Supreme Court of India, meaning thereby that such damage was made which was irreparable. The Supreme Court says that it is the failure of justice. In such a state of circumstance, if these cases between the administration and the individual are allowed to be decided by these ordinary or formal courts, certainly that would be injustice and that would also be contrary to or that would also be hazardous to the welfare activities on the part of the state or the government. This is also the reason for the emergence of adjudicatory powers of the government. I have already told you that the formal rigid and flexible judicial procedure, it also becomes many times the reason for the delay by the courts because the courts are to follow the long rigid procedure for making the final decision. Then it was thought that some such technique should be evolved in which only by providing, only by following, only by adopting the minimum procedure which makes the proceedings fair or which is essential in that particular circumstance, in a given circumstance for making the proceedings fair. If any such technique is evolved wherein only the minimum procedure is required, such a minimum procedure which makes the proceedings fair then we can resolve this issue of delay of the decision making by the courts and the administrative adjudication or the decision making functions of decision making powers of the administration. It came out as the resolution of this particular problem that we can make the administrative adjudication by following only the minimum fair procedure. The administrative adjudicatory authority are not required to follow any such rigid or formal procedure as the court follow in the form of civil procedure code, in the form of criminal procedure code, in the form of evidence act. The courts are to follow the rigid procedure, but the administrative authorities enjoying the adjudicatory powers, they are not bound by these procedures. This is also one reason for the emergence of the decision making powers of the administration. One more relevant reason for the emergence of the decision making powers of the administration is lack of specialization, lack of expertise and the lack of technical knowledge in the judges of formal courts. We know that during the development of the concept of a state from laissez faire to welfare a state concept, there are many developments. 18th and 19th century was also the century of the scientific, technological and technical developments newer and newer subject matters came into existence and the judges who are appointed in the courts, though they have very sound legal knowledge, but mostly they are unaware of all these or they are not skilled, they are not experts, they do not have the knowledge of those particular issues which involves any such technicalities or complexities and that was also the reason that the persons who are not, who do not have the knowledge, who do not have the expertise on such a subject matter, how can they decide, how can they, 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 they can understand the considerations of such subject matters or the details of such 
subject matters. How can they do justice with the litigants? That was also one reason for which the administrative adjudicatory process emerges out. One important reason for the emergence of the administrative adjudicatory functions is the consideration of law vis a vis consideration of policies. There are two set of courts, there are two set of the bodies exercising the adjudicatory powers, one the formal courts and other the administrative authorities, administrative agencies. If we compare the mode of functioning of these two adjudicatory bodies, we know that courts always work on the basis of the considerations of law. They apply the law on the facts, but in this regime of social welfare concept where the state always in need of applying the socio-economic schemes and policies for the welfare of the people, the policy considerations also become important the policy considerations also become significant. Whenever there is a dispute between the administration and one individual with respect to or regarding to any particular socio-economic scheme. For example, if the state is to establish any new hospital in an area and for that purpose the state is acquiring the land, there may be the disputes between the state and the owners of the land of that area. If these disputes are decided only on the basis of the considerations of law, then the objective of social welfare state would certainly frustrate. And therefore, it is required that these disputes should be handled or should be decided. Also, taking into consideration the policy considerations, but the courts they do not take into consideration the policy considerations, they always take into account the considerations of law and they make the justice on the basis of legal considerations. So, the need to take into account the policy considerations also in making the decisions between the administration and the individual particularly with the reference to socio-economic schemes and policies. It became relevant, it became important to have some process like administrative adjudication which may make the decisions by taking into consideration the policies or policy matters. In this regard, it would also be relevant to quote the statement of Wade and Phillips. Wade and Phillips say that the modern government gives rise to many disputes which cannot appropriately be resolved by applying objective legal principles or standards and depend ultimately on what is desirable in the public interest as a matter of social policy. So, they are of the opinion that there are cert certainly there are some disputes which cannot be decided only on the basis of legal considerations. The policy considerations are also important for deciding these cases and therefore, the administrative adjudicatory process came into existence to make the determinations of the disputes between the administration and the individual by applying by taking account the policy considerations also. One more reason for the emergence of the administrative adjudicatory process was the need for expeditious disposal of disputes. If these disputes between the administration and the individual are delayed, are not decided within the specified time period, within the specified time framework, then again the socio-economic policies which are involved in these disputes, the objective of these, these policies or schemes would frustrate. And therefore, these administrative disputes always require the expeditious determination of these. 
that was also the region for having or for, for finding out any some special technique or the process by which we can resolve the administrative disputes expeditiously and the administrative adjudication came forward to do this work or to fulfill this need. One more important reason for the emergence of administrative adjudicatory processes is the informal atmosphere of administrative decision making process. The atmosphere of the courts or the normal ordinary lit litigation process, it is very formal. Whereas, as compared to the court procedure, we see that the atmosphere of administrative adjudication is formal that is also one reason to support the administrative adjudication particularly by resolving or by dis for deciding the administrative disputes. The administrative decision making seems to be easily accessible wherein it is not always mandatory for the disputants for the citizens who are going to fight against the administration to have the legal assistance or to have a lawyer to fight their case. They can directly go to the administration and they can access the administrative adjudicatory process. The administrative adjudicatory process is also cost effective. It is cheaper as compared to the court procedure. The administrative adjudicatory process is flexible also as compared to the procedure of the court. The courts of law and the administrative adjudicatory process, there are two set of bodies enjoying the administrative, enjoying the adjudicatory functions, enjoying the ad adjudicatory powers, making the determination of the disputes. One, for making the determination of disputes between the administration and the individuals and the other the courts having the power to making the determination of all kinds of cases. The English and American approach differ as to the distinction in a court of law and an administrative body exercising adjudicatory powers. Both the approaches have the point of distinction with reference to the distinction in the court and tribunal, distinction in the court and the administrative authority exercising the judicial powers, exercising the adjudicatory powers. And this difference to understand these two bodies by Americans and by Britishers is due to the different constitutional philosophy, the different viewpoint of their legal system. We know that American legal system is founded on the doctrine of separation of powers, the power of judicial review wherein the judicial review of administrative action, the judicial review of legislative action, both are there. Whereas, the American legal system is based on the principle of parliamentary sovereignty and the principle of rule of law, where there cannot be the review of legislative action. So, this difference in the constitutional philosophy at two places difference in the legal viewpoint or the constitutional viewpoint or the viewpoint of the American and British system, it is the reason to have the difference in the opinion as to the distinction between the courts and the administrative bodies enjoying the adjudicatory functions or decision making powers. If we try to find out or understand this difference in the approach of Americans and Britishers, it seems that Americans lay reliance on courts and judicial means for addressing administrative issues, whereas the British approach lay more emphasis on informal administrative process which is suited to laymen, which is suited to the common man. This is the basic difference in the American approach to distinguish between the courts and the adjudicatory, administrative adjudicatory bodies and the British approach. The English view 
distinguishes in a court and administrative adjudicative body on the basis of law and policy as we have already discussed that the courts apply the considerations of law whereas the administrative adjud adjudicative bodies apply the considerations of policy in determining the disputes. According to the British view, the courts apply law to the facts and an administrative agency exercising judicial powers apply the policy to the facts. This point of distinction seems not to be real, particularly with reference to India that courts apply the law to the facts, whereas the administrative adjudicative bodies apply the policies to the facts. If we refer to very important, significant, illustrious case decided by the Supreme Court of India in the name of Menka Gandhi versus Union of India, we can understand that the British approach to make the distinction in the courts and ad administrative adjudicative bodies seems not to be real. In Menka Gandhi case, the Supreme Court of India applied the policy considerations, the prevailing social philosophy in the country, change in the social philosophy in the country, these policy considerations, the, 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 the social policy of the country that was taken into account by the Supreme Court in deciding the Menka Gandhi case and that was the reason for which the Supreme Court of India could distinguish between the decision made earlier in A.K. Gopalan case and then in Menka Gandhi case. Legal considerations were not applied whereas the policy considerations were applied. Legal considerations were applied in A.K. Gopalan case but Supreme Court says that that was not correct. The law should also be reasonable, just and fair. The principles of natural justice were incorporated by the Supreme Court of India in the decision making process and in the law making process also. It is also relevant to mention that even the tribunals, many tribunals, they apply the considerations of law or they apply the law to the facts in deciding the cases. And they decide the cases in an objective manner without being affected by policy considerations. You can refer to the functioning of income tax tribunal in India and we can also refer to the working of the green tribunal in India. Friends, the American approach lays emphasis on the position of, of the decision maker. Who is the decision maker? With respect to this consideration, the American approach or American philosophers, they distinguish between the courts and tribunal. According to them, in a court of law, a person who is making the decision, he is always disconnected, independent and impartial. Whereas, in an administrative adjudicatory process, he is not neutral and impartial person. He can never be neutral and impartial person because he is the part of the same administration against which he is hearing the case and from this point of view, they differentiate the court and the administrative adjudicatory authorities. Distinction as to the nature of functions, judicial and quasi-judicial that has also been the basis to distinguish between the courts and the tribunals, courts and administrative adjudicatory bodies by the Americans. They say that the judges of the court, they exercise the judicial functions whereas the members of adjudicatory, administrative adjudicatory bodies, they exercise not the judicial functions but the quasi-judicial functions. Difference as to the procedure, it has been adopted by both by the Americans and by the Britishers because the courts apply very formal, very rigid, very inflexible procedure which has been either set out by the constitution itself or by the legislative enactments by the competent legislatures. Whereas, the administrative adjudicatory bodies, they are not bound by any such formal procedure. They are required to follow only the minimum fair procedure or the minimum procedure which makes the proceedings fair 
in a given circumstance. There is also the distinction in the courts and administrative adjudicatory bodies as to their range of jurisdiction. The range of jurisdiction of administrative adjudicatory bodies is very confined, is very limited as compared to the jurisdiction of the courts. The tribunals does not have jurisdiction to decide on the constitutionality of the legislation. Only the administrative tribunals like central administrative tribunal etc., they can determine the constitutionality of the legislation other than the legislation by which they are created. Otherwise, normally the administrative adjudicative bodies or the tribunals, they cannot determine the constitutionality or the validity of any legislation which has been made by the competent legislature, whereas the courts always have the authority to interpret the laws made by the competent legislature, whether these are valid or not, whether these are constitutional or not. The distinction as to the structure of courts and tribunals, the distinction as to the structure and qualification of the courts and tribunals, this has also been the basis to distinguish between, between these two. Friends, after understanding the administrative adjudicatory process, why it came into existence, what is it and what is the points of distinction between the courts and administrative adjudicatory bodies, we are to see that what are the challenges to the administrative decision making process. The administrative decision making process, it was introduced during the 20th century because of the change in the philosophy of the state. This is new as compared to the process of the court and therefore, it has many challenges to meet. What are the challenges? These challenges are quantity and intricacy. There is bewildering variety of administrative decision making process. There is no uniformity, there is no preciseness. The bewildering quantity of administrative decision making bodies and among them we cannot identify a particular kind of bodies making the administrative adjudication. There is also the problem that there is incomprehensible diversity of the procedure. Procedure is not articulated, inarticulate procedure is there. The variety of procedures being adopted by the administrative authorities enjoying the adjudicatory functions and therefore, there cannot be any mandatory obligation over an administrative adjudicatory authority to follow a particular procedure in making the decisions and the administrative adjudicatory bodies can take the benefit of this lack of any formal or set procedure to be followed. One more challenge before the administrative decision making process is disorganized and haphazard system of appeal. There is no uniform system of appeal, there is no set system of appeal that from which administrative adjudicatory bodies appeal will go to which particular body. And this is also the challenge, this also creates the confusion amongst the people. The fickleness and obscurity of decisions, decisions cannot be understood easily because no particular procedure is being provided. And no particular mandation is given to or mandatory obligation is imposed over these administrative adjudicatory authorities to give the decision in a particular way and what would be the, would be the format of that decision. Even the requirement of de region decision wherein the authority or decision maker is required to give the reasons for its decision that is not mandatory for the administrative adjudicatory authority it depends on the parent act whether it provides for any such mandatory requirement or not particularly in India. Therein there are various exceptions to these requirements like region decision and 
the administrative adjudicatory authorities they can take the benefit of these exceptions also. The combination of functions it is also one important challenge before the administrative adjudicatory bodies and administrative adjudicatory bodies these are becoming continuously overburdened because of this. When the administrative authority is to perform both kinds of functions it is initial or primarily assigned functions like purely simple and pure administrative functions in addition to this the administrative authority the same administrative authority is also required to exercise the adjudicatory powers. Sometimes it also creates the confusion and the reason for suspecting or having the suspicion of possibility of bias on the part of the decision maker. There is no formal rule of evidence how the evidence is to be collected. The administrative adjudicatory authorities they are totally dependent of the principles of natural justice. So, no proper rule of evidence is followed by these authorities. The official and departmental bias it is also one important issue we will discuss in detail the official and departmental bias under the topic of principles of natural justice. Here at this point of discussion we should all only know about this departmental bias or official bias that when the decision maker or the administrative adjudicatory authority is connected to the preparation of any particular policy or a scheme how can it give the fair decision unbiased decision impartial decision when the challenge is made against this policy and the functionaries the officials of the same department become the hearing officer to hear the objections against it this is also the big question on the impartiality or fairness of the administrative adjudicatory process. One more relevant challenge before the administrative adjudicatory body is the administration always functions works under the supervision of the legislators as we know that the executive is responsible to the legislature. This administration is always in direct touch of the politicians because the government is run by those political leaders and therefore, it is not always free from political interference. The political interference in the decision making process by the administration is a big challenge wherein the political in interference may make the administrative adjudicatory process as unfair, unjust, unreasonable. There is the lack of region decisions as I already told you that no mandatory requirement is there for the requirement of giving the regions by the decision makers in the process of administrative adjudication. It depends on the parent act whether it provides for any such requirement or not. So, this is also one challenge. There are various modes of administrative adjudication. There is variety of the modes of administrative adjudication. So, what are the modes of administrative adjudication? It is also important for us to know. As I told you that there is bewildering variety of ways to exercise the powers of administrative adjudication and which results into the bewildering variety of modes of administrative adjudication or the bewildering variety of administrative adjudicatory bodies. The most common and popular mode is tribunals. The administrative adjudication is mostly done by the tribunals though there are very other means many other means are there even the smaller administrative bodies they are enjoying the adjudicatory body functions. We also know this practical point of view where we see 
even the sub divisional officers or sub divisional magistrates, district magistrates, tahsildars, they, they, they also enjoy the adjudicatory functions or adjudicatory powers. So, other than these smaller units or the administrative decision making bodies, generally the administrative adjudication at the large scale is made by the tribunals. Now, there is the difference in the tribunals and the courts also. Tribunals are the administrative adjudicatory bodies, whereas the courts are the judicial bodies. You can refer to the Kyoto Hulohan versus Jachilu case with this regard, wherein the question was there whether an authority exercising decision making power is a tribunal. That was the question before the Supreme Court in Kyoto Hulohan case. Whether an authority which exercises the decision making power is tribunal and if any authority exercising the decision making power is termed to be tribunal, then all the administrative adjudicatory bodies will become tribunal. The Supreme Court in the case pointed out a test to know whether any administrative adjudicatory body is tribunal or not. The Supreme Court says that the cases which are decided by that body, whether these have any less, the point of distinction, the list means the, the dispute. So, the dispute must be there for being the tribunal under the power exercising by the body, there must be the dispute, there must be the list between two parties. Number two, whether the dispute involves determination on rights and obligations of the parties, whether the determination by administrative adjudicatory body, it involves the determination of the rights and obligations of the parties and whether the authority is called upon to decide it. So, if any administrative authority decides two important aspects of any dispute on of any case that whether that case involves the list between two parties, there are two parties and there is the dispute between two parties and number two, whether that dispute involves the determination of rights and obligations of the parties. If it is so, then that administrative authority, that administrative adjudicatory body would be termed as tribunal. If we see the meaning of the term tribunal, then it seems that the term tribunal does not have any fixed meaning and it is used in different senses. All the administrative authorities exercising quasi judicial powers irrespective of their autonomy may be termed as tribunal. All administrative adjudicatory bodies independent of the department in disputes, they are also the tribunal. So, the term tribunal may be used in various senses. Number one, the meaning of, of the term tribunal may include all administrative authorities which exercise the decision making powers, which exercise the adjudicatory powers irrespective of their autonomy, whether these are autonomous bodies or these are bodies run by the members of the department itself, these are the tribunal. The second meaning to the term tribunal is that tribunals are those bodies which are independent of the department in dispute, these bodies can be called to be tribunal. The term tribunal has also been used in article 136 of the constitution. So, the tribunal as defined in one article 136, these are also the tribunals. The term tribunal as used in article 323A and 323B of Indian constitution, these are also considered to be tribunal in one respect. There are four kinds of the tribunals. Number one, all the administrative authorities irrespective of their autonomy, if these authorities exercise the administrative functions. Number two, the tribunal or the administrative adjudicatory bodies which are autonomous in relation to the disputes or they do not have any direct connection with the department against which they are hearing 
the disputes and number 3 the tribunal as it is used in article 136 in the meaning as it is there in 136 of constitution the tribunal as it is the meaning of the tribunal as it is there in 323a and 323b of indian constitution we know that in 323a and 323b of indian constitution the administrative tribunals are prescribed the parliament is given the power to create the administrative tribunals there is the question of the constitutionality of those tribunals whether these tribunals can be given the status of the high courts or the supreme court or not the supreme court of india in l chandra kumar case has clearly established that no the parliamentary courts cannot the statutory courts cannot be given the status of the constitutional courts the high courts and the supreme court of india are created by the constitution and therefore they cannot be given the status equal to the constitutional courts what is the procedure of administrative adjudication it is also very important aspect of the administrative adjudication there is no we, we are continuously discussing that there is no prescribed procedure to be followed by administrative authorities in exercising the adjudicatory bodies and it always depends on the parent act if it provides for any procedure then the authorities to follow that procedure prescribed by the parent act if the parent act leaves this discretion to the administrative authority itself to devise its procedure then the administrative adjudicatory body can decide its procedure itself when the administrative authority or administrative adjudicatory body is given the discretion to decide its own procedure to follow it may take the consideration of its own convenience and it may ignore the considerations of fairness to the individuals justice to the individuals freedoms the preservation of the freedoms liberties rights of the individuals and therefore the courts have always insisted on the minimum fair procedure to be followed by these administrative authorities we know because of this fact that the parent act may provide for any procedure or may not the administrative adjudicatory bodies can themselves be given the authority to devise their own procedure there is the bewildering variety of there is unintelligible there is inarticulate variety of procedure and therefore that has also been the reason for the course to insist on the minimum fair procedure to be followed by the administrative bodies the minimum fair procedure means the procedure which is required the minimum procedure which is required to be followed in a given circumstance to make the proceedings fair and it refers to the principles of natural justice in the next lecture we will discuss about the meaning concept and various rules of principles of natural justice but the minimum fair procedure which is required to be followed by these authorities on which the courts have been insisted is the principles of natural justice and the english and indian courts from time immemorial have been using or adopting these principles of natural justice in making the adjudication or in making the administrative adjudication in modern meaning the principles of natural justice these refer to the judicial certain judicial procedure ju certain judicial norms certain rules of the judicial procedure and these principles of natural justice these were from very ancient period have been adopted have been followed by the courts in making the adjudication in boham's case 1610 the english court refers to the principles of natural justice to be followed by the administrative adjudicatory bodies in back's case 
in 1615 it was referred by the court that the administrative adjudicatory bodies should follow should adopt the principles of natural justice in making the adjudication. Bentley case is also the example which was decided in 1748. Cooper versus Bandsworth Board of Work, it is also the example where the court insisted on the principles of natural justice to be followed by the administrative bodies in making the adjudication, in exercising the decision making powers. Board of Education versus Rice, it is the great example. The case was decided by House of Lords, wherein the House of Lords insisted on the principles of natural justice or the minimum fair procedure to be followed by the administrative bodies. Ridge versus Baldwin, it is also the example wherein a constable was dismissed from his post without giving the fair hearing and the House of Lords quashed the decision of the watch committee on the basis that watch committee dismissed an employee or the constable without providing the fair opportunity or the sufficient and adequate opportunity of hearing the rules of natural justice or minimum fair procedure was not followed by the watch committee and on this basis it was dismissed this decision of watch committee was dismissed by house of lords these are the examples wherein we can see that the courts have always been insisted on a minimum fair procedure to be adopted by these administrative adjudicatory bodies these administrative adjudicatory authorities, the administrative authorities which are enjoying the decision making powers. What are these principles of natural justice? What does this minimum fair procedure mean? And what are two important or fundamental principles or the rules of this minimum fair procedure or the natural justice? We will discuss in the next lecture, in the next session. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude, immoral, vulgar and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you 
in the next episode of Literary Snippets.